for your 703 at Charlie Tower. Good afternoon. Transition westbound approved. Delta number uh, 3001. 301 to Western Cruise Ray, Charlie. Thank you. I feel like I sounded a little bit like mean on the radio there. I just made it sound so pissed off. That's okay. We controllers have no feelings, so it's okay. Roger. Welcome back to Podcasting on a Plane, the podcast where we share stories from Airworld, as told from my home base out here in West Coast Delta. And I can assure you that most of us, well, we do in fact have feelings. Well, the ones who make mistakes, at least. Uh, no, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. We have feelings. And the reason I know is because I'm experiencing one right now. Sort of a seriousness and anxiety a little bit. And it's really unfounded. It's all in my head. But that's because I've got something coming up fun this week. Nobody's favorite annual occurrence, my AME visit. Yeah. Well, Miami's not half bad. I actually like the guy. And you're going to hear about that a little bit more in the show. But nobody's ever particularly stoked about going to the doctor, particularly not the AME. And now that I'm old enough that I have to do it every single year, well, that makes it all the more fun. And as a matter of fact, last time I was there, his uh, EKG machine kind of went on the fritz and pretty much told me I had minutes to live. Now, obviously, it was not really adjusted some electrodes and I was fine. But it's just one little bit of icing on that cake of fun that I just really wish we didn't have to deal with every year. And maybe even every time you got to go see the doctor. I mean, maybe it's not the same in all parts of the country, but out here in the super populous areas, healthcare tends to be dominated by the major healthcare networks where to go see my doctor, I've got to log onto a website and then make an appointment that's probably going to be in six weeks. And if I need to see someone before that, I can go to the urgent care, which is actually pretty good. A family friend of ours runs the one by my house, actually, but that's just me being lucky. In general, anytime you have a run in with healthcare, it's probably not a super enjoyable experience. But maybe there's something we can do about that. And, and maybe he who does something about that might even know something about aviation medicine, too, because it's different for us, right? For an aviator, you can't just take any old medication and then go to work and that's it. Medicine is like a virtual minefield with which you have to tiptoe through to keep your certificate or your medical clearance or whatever it is that allows you to do whatever you do here in Airworld. It's like a Jeopardy event. And I wish that more doctors knew about it. But they don't, and I guess I can't blame them. But there's one who does. And look, I may not make a podcast every week or, let's be honest, even every month. But when I do, I'd like to think that the person I bring you is going to be chock full of actionable content or at least be really entertaining. But today, it's definitely, well, it's both, but definitely the former. And what he's going to say might actually change the way medicine works for you finally in aviation. And I'm going to teach you a new vocabulary word too. Don't go away. And with that, Dr. Eric Fine, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me today. All right. Well, we've been wanting to do this for a really, 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 really long time. And you were here way back at the beginning of the thing that shall not be mentioned that started the fun of the last couple of years. And this time, I don't know, I'd like to think you're back under a lot, lot better circumstances because you've got something kind of cool up your sleeve and that other thing we're going to talk about that as little as possible today and we're going to have a good time, right? <laughs> we're going to have a great time. Yeah, I really uh, appreciate you bringing me back on your show today. Uh, I think it's we're going to have a lot of uh, great things to talk about. For sure. All right. Well, for those who don't remember, Dr. Eric Fine is a practicing doctor and he's also a very avid pilot. And since the last time you're on the show, uh, what have you been flying? So I believe last time uh, I was on the show, I was still I was still flying a Mooney, who's was an M20F, uh, pretty much a, a, a J model. I ended up selling that and I ended up getting a, a G1 Cirrus now, uh, not the turbo, but just the regular. And I've been flying that uh, quite regularly for work and also for some pleasure uh, flying. And it's been uh, remarkable. Uh, I haven't lost my pilot skills. Uh, I still make sure I uh, feel like I'm flying a Mooney. Yeah, you know what's funny? When I, when I think about you, I think you're sort of like the poster child for when AOPA is lobbying for what people use airplanes for just to go from place to place within a region and conduct business there and then go to another place and conduct business there too and then be home for dinner. Yeah, so when I was on about two years ago, we uh, well, I was flying uh, back and forth from uh, western Pennsylvania to eastern Pennsylvania uh, where I live. Uh, and that was for work. Uh, on occasion, I'd go to Michigan or I'd go down to uh, uh, Florida if needed. And during COVID, having a young child, it definitely was something that was a lot easier for me to do. Uh, 
greatly decreased the risk for everybody else, uh, considering the fact that I was in uh, a lot of COVID wards for the long uh, for a long part of the time of that, and uh, it, it really was uh, a great tool for me uh, to to use and expedite getting home at night to see the family. Cool. So, what what part of the country are you primarily flying around? So, I've flown pretty much east of Chicago. Uh, I've been over the past two years. I've flown uh, Michigan, Ohio, Indiana, Pennsylvania. Oh, you know the Mid Atlantic. You know Delaware, uh, Carolinas, all the way down to Florida, and it's been just a joy to be able to not have to fly the airlines. Yeah, for sure. I mean, at any time that would have been true, but especially now. So you've introduced a new word to my vernacular lately. It's called volosan. Volosan, yes. Volosan. There we see. I can't even get it right. But wh- that's how I what, say what, it. What is... I have no idea if that's the right way to pronounce it. I say it as, as volosan. Okay. Well, more importantly, then, what does it mean, and what does it mean to you and us now? So volosan. Uh, is my medical practice, which uh, the, the literal translation is uh, Valar to fly and Sano and his health. And for me, I've wanted to merge those two, uh, you know, those two passions of life uh, f- forever. It's, this has been a project ongoing for about seven years. And so the practice is literally a, a primary care practice for pilots and aircrew. It is made to take care of pilots so they can always continue to fly, but more importantly, to take care of their health, and not have to worry about insurance or co-pays or the FAA or the government, uh, just pilot and, and, their, and their doctor. Uh, so, so with my unique background, uh, I was a former uh, Air Force flight surgeon. Obviously, I'm a pilot. I'm also a primary care doctor. I also did uh, the residency in aerospace medicine, which is like a two years master's program and fellowship in aerospace medicine and space medicine. So all of those come together to kind of uh, put me in a position to really be able to take care of the the aviator uh, when they're at home and when they're away. Yeah. So as we record this, my AME visit's coming up in one, two, three weeks. So when this thing airs, it'll probably be right before that. And, um, I, I gotta say, I'm not really ever looking forward to that visit, you know, and, and, and I don't really have anything. Yeah, it's never a fun. Yeah. Like, I mean, I don't have anything I'm particularly worried about. I mean, for those who know me, I'm, I'm pretty fit. I mean, I, I, I lift, I cycle, I, I'm, you know, we eat good nutrition and all that kind of stuff. Um, the stress in my life could be lower, but in general, you know, I'm doing okay. It's kind of the Americana, right? Yeah. I mean, it's pretty much the dream. So, all right. Well, anyway, like if I were to come to actually I even and I even like my uh, AME by the way too which I mean how many people can say that right <laughs> but he's actually a cool guy so if, if assuming I need a medical like I got that coming up right and maybe I'm one of those people who isn't so hot on seeing my my AME is, is this like the kind of thing where you could do like a teledoc thing and I could get that from you or or, or what are we talking about here so that's a great question uh, so up front I am not an AME now, I know many of the people who work at the FAA. I know people in the AOPA, AOPA office, um, as well as uh, a lot of the, the aerospace medical community. It's a relatively tight-knit community, and they're very great people. They do really good work. Apart with some people uh, sometimes have frustrations uh, in Oklahoma City, but they do do very good work. Um, so my practice is kind of, uh, is there to maintain that confidentiality between, uh, you and your doctor, right? So many people have their Amy and those other people, other people, uh, those same people will also have, uh, possibly their, uh, primary care doctor and not everything crosses over, right? So you'll have, you'll say one thing to your primary care doctor. It's not really a big deal. You don't have to answer the question per se on the 8,500. So it's never there. Uh, and, and not that that would be an issue, but it, it, it comes to, to uh, a fracture of care, right? So how are we actually taking care of people and, and counseling people for their, for their medical? So as you said, you know, you're coming up for your AME, you're a relatively healthy guy. I'm assuming you, you go to a doctor possibly uh, annually or semi-annually, and it sounds like you're, you're pretty fit. But nobody likes going to the AME because the best you can do is it's a draw, right? So the best you can do is, all right, I'm still flying, right? The worst that could happen is they take your medical, uh, and, you know, temporarily or permanently. Uh, and sometimes it's kind of like a deferred thing, right? Nobody likes any the anything but flying, right? That's what we always want. That's what AMEs want, right? Because it makes everybody happy. So, so what I do, 
I usually take care of the patient before we even get to the AME, right? So I, I'm, I'm trained in all the AME stuff, uh, you know, all the aerospace med specialty stuff, I'm familiar with all of that, all the regs, what needs to be done, who to contact, how to get those things done. Uh, so I can prevent complications before you end up at the AME's office, right? So let's say you have high blood pressure, let's say you, you have protein in your urine, or let's say you have, you know, headaches or something like that, that are very reasonable, common medical ailments that you can all pretty much fly on without any big issue, but you just need to have the documentation. Uh, that's where Volason really comes in, right? So we're your primary care doctor, we take care of you, uh, and we, we may very well be uh, ruling out a uh, product to where we will review your chart and you uh, prior to you going to your AME, uh, and then you pretty much have a... Uh, uh, a proof of bill of health and you take it to your primary care or sorry your AME and they give you the certification uh, so so that's my objective is to be that pilot patient advocate okay so it's not like a dubious thing like hey hey don't go to him come to me first right <laughs> but no. but it's you have all these issues where yeah we all know we filled out that form I mean I'll, I'll be open about it. I checked yes to a couple of those boxes in the middle of the form, like back before it was a Med Express, and you had that that carbon form you had to fill right. out. And because I was, was I fourteen or sixteen or something when I filled that form out the first time, and and the way that they asked the questions, it just says, you know, hey, have you ever had something like this? And I was like, well, I don't know, maybe okay, sure. You know, I was trying to be honest, but right. I, I didn't really have that when I learned later what they were actually asking. I mean, God, I wish I'd checked no to all of them because I did not, in fact, have those conditions. However, you know, if you make a mistake and check one of those boxes, that follows you forever. Yeah. And and not only that, but there's a lot of other stuff in those forms where it's sort of like, you know, to to go back and correct what might have been an error is is an unbelievable pain in the you know what and and i know there's probably people driving and sitting around and doing work right now listen to this just nodding their heads like oh yeah that i remember that eight months or year or right. whatever it was it took to get through oklahoma city for some like you just said relatively small common ailment that doesn't really probably even affect my safety of flight so you can basically jump in there and almost act i guess what you're saying is is like a consultant yeah, like, like an interview prep or something like that. Well, I wouldn't say it's interview prep, right? So, so I'm, it, it is a medical evaluation. It is a a a, a, a not a clearance, but a, a kind of a stratification of where uh, somebody might be. But as you alluded to, right? So there are a lot of things, especially in kind of our generation. Uh, if physicians were very. Um, uh, physicians easily offer diagnoses for things that they may or may not have had. For multiple reasons, which is a whole other discussion about how the medical system in America is and how it functions and how it pays, which uh, my, my practice is direct primary care, which is another section that we should discuss it a little, little bit later here. But what that means is, so let's say a kid had a diagnosis of, let's say, uh, headaches. And for some, for some reason, somebody put the diagnosis of migraines. Well, everybody you know, 90% of Americans or humans will have some headache at some point in their in their life, right? But most people don't get migraines. And and the 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 layperson uh, use of migraines isn't a big deal, but if it's in the chart, that's a big deal. So so that becomes more of an issue related to how do we discharge these duties, how do we make sure that this is okay, and how do we clear this person? But if you were to go to the AME and you were to say, hey, you know, uh, I, I had migraines, you know, three, four years ago, but I, I don't have any headaches. Now I'm fine. Well, that's a big, that's a big yellow flag that needs to be evaluated. That's something that's easily able to be uh, evaluated and probably even cleared with documentation. So all you have to do is be open and, you know, to the FAA, because the FAA is the, the biggest thing the FAA does not like is when you lie, right? If you don't know, or you have a medical problem, they're going to do everything they can to get you up. But if you lie to them, it's, it's a big deal. So if we can be open and forward with them and present the correct documentation and work up, then you shouldn't have a problem at all. And that's my objective with that. Okay. Yeah, fair enough. So you, you know which one I actually hear about a lot, just as a fun side note here, is, so remember in like the late 90s when all the uh, – antidepressants came out like the Zoloft mm -hmm. and the Pax and all that mm -hmm. you, you you know it was sort of one of those I mean I'm sure you know as well as anyone that sort of back 
side of that, like how much doctors probably were paid or kicked back or whatever to prescribe those medications. And so guess what? You roll into your doctor and you say, man, you know, I'm, I'm feeling a little, yeah, I'm feeling a little down lately. You know, my, my life's kind of changed or I got some change. Oh, you, here, take these, right? That's great. But to give you those, I'd have to diagnose you as depressed mm -hmm. or something of the such like. Right. Well, that's a big one on that form, for instance. Right. And you know how many people I've talked to where that issue came up because X many years ago, 20 years ago, something like that. And, you know, the 90s, when those came out, somebody took them. And now like, well, shoot, I got to declare that or I, you know, or, or they could check on, like you said, lying, right? Maybe they were, they were not clinically depressed, but they were diagnosed that way so as to be prescribed that medication. So now there is a record of that, but the patient might argue otherwise. But I mean, that could put you in a really sticky situation, I suppose. So there's two things to that. One, um, so the FAA just in May of 22 uh, 2022 has changed a lot of that uh, initial evaluation uh, clearance. So before, if you had ever had any history of depression or anxiety, any time, it, it was a deferral, right? So they needed to do an evaluation. Some of this came from the German Winds incident about seven years ago. So that was a huge, huge issue. Uh, and the FAA got, tightened its belt very, you know, very strongly with this and said, you look, we have to be very strong with psychological illness. It's a big deal. Obviously, you can have catastrophic occurrences such as this. Um, obviously, there's also a concern of uh, uh, a possible uh, psychological impairment related to uh, China aircraft uh, that's being investigated right now, the 7-3. However, that is under investigation. I'm not uh, say, stating it is anything in particular, uh, but uh, you can see what the FAA uh, has has essentially, or the NTSB, I don't know who's, who's done this part of the investigation, uh, what their prelim is on that. Uh, so mental health is a big deal. So the FAA now has it. So if you have had anything five years or longer in the past and you don't have any other symptoms from mild depression or mild anxiety, or I believe mild depression, uh, it's really, uh, we call it situational depression, right? So something's going on in your life uh, and it's really bogging you down and maybe a doctor gives you a diagnosis and gives you a medication for a short time and it goes away. Then, then it's likely not a problem at all, and it's something that can be issued by your AME. But anything more than that needs a little bit more uh, uh, investigation, but a lot of this can be teased out by a review of records uh, and an evaluation by the, you know, of the patient as they are today. And that's really kind of telling, and people don't have as much anxiety related to their evaluation by the AME uh, when they kind of understand that a lot of this should be just fine, especially if they've seen a doctor before and said, yeah, no, everything's fine. Uh, and here's the documentation to prove it. All right. It's almost like, I think maybe we need to have you back to discuss this stuff on a somewhat regular basis. I would love to do that. I think one of the big things in aviation, right? So one of the big things in aviation, there is a very Sep uh, large chasm between medical and and the pilots, right? And the the closer we marry that, uh, the easier we can have these conversations. The less likely we are to withhold things. And I think overall, the healthier we'll be. I think that's that's what needs to be done. Uh, so I, I would definitely welcome that to uh, come back and help with uh, either talking with people or uh, just going over certain things that people are interested. In. Yeah, for sure. So real quick, back just before we move on here on the FAA medical stuff. So you're not an AME, so you're, I can't like come to you for my, my second class or something, but um, what about basic med? So basic med definitely do that. And I think that's where a lot of uh, my practice uh, it is very helpful to the uh, aviation world, right? So uh, I've heard a lot of people having difficulties finding a doctor to do basic med. Uh, there are a lot of large institutions, some on the West Coast, that will not allow you to do uh, basic med uh, by their primary care doctors because of the liability that they assume. Ironically, there is a clause in the basic med law that says the doctor can't be held liable, but be that as it may. So, that, yes, basic med is something we do. Uh, I would recommended for patients who I think it would be a good thing for. They uh, have chronic issues that can be well managed and 
uh, once you have either a special issuance or not a special issuance, depending on what it is, uh, it's just a regular educational see you annually or biannually uh, and doing uh, the right thing by you. Uh, you get your education. Uh, I have my own education as well to go through and we sign you off. Uh, I, I think it's a great program in the setting of the right physician. I think there are a lot of people who sign off on it that have no idea what they're doing. Uh, not that that's a horrible thing because it's just a clinical evaluation, but I think uh, a physician pilot is the one who's probably best to do that. Sure. I mean, obviously, I mean, my primary doctor is at one of the larger health systems, and I don't know actually whether or not my primary would do that or if that's one of the ones, like you said, that, that has that prohibition on there. But yeah, I mean, I, I know several people that have come to me and said, you know, I went to my primary care for the evaluation and I brought that form and some of the guidance, I think they printed off from like AOPA yep. and wherever. And, and the doctor was still just like, dude, I don't know what to do with this. I mean, I'll, I'll, right. I'll do these tests, but it can get really comprehensive. And I've heard everything right. from them just being like, yo, I'm not going to do it all the way up to okay. But then it ends up being like this four hour visit, right. which was 10 times more comprehensive than a first class would have been. And right you know, five times intrusive. So, right. okay. So yeah, to, to be able to come to somebody like you who could be that primary care and that also has a clue about aviation, that would sort of be the dream, I suppose. That's what I'd hope to bring, right? So so I want to give the maximum amount of, uh, of, of medical care uh, holding to the criteria needed for their, their, their certificate or their, their license. I guess it's a certificate, not their license. Uh, so, so, that's what it comes down to. There are, uh, I, I've heard of certain medical malpractice insurance company that will not allow their doctors to do it because of the liability associated with this. Uh, and that's a whole nother uh, discussion. Uh, but but yeah, that, that really kind of comes to a problem when people wait for, you know, days, weeks, or months to see their doctor and the doctor's like, hey, I, I, there's nothing I can do about this, even though you brought everything you're supposed to. Uh, but that said, I, I'm not going to, you know, uh, hold the, you know, let the doctors kind of be out on their own there. Uh, there's also a lot of complex patients out there that uh, do come in and they don't come in regularly. Uh, so if they come in every, you know, six months to a year, uh, there's going to be more things that need to be done during that time uh, to to get them, you know, educated and, and quote unquote, uh, reviewed for their basic med. All right. So let's just let's just dumb this down as much as you can for me here. So I'm looking on your website and Volus on direct primary care. So in a way, well, not in a way in you are uh, primary care, but you're saying, well, what makes us different from the average primary care practice? So in your own words, besides, I mean, I can read this off the website just like anyone, but what what, what in your yeah. own words makes you different than your average primary care? So a couple of things. So, so from a primary care perspective, uh, we are there wholly for the patient, right? So there's no insurance, there's no co-pays, there's no uh, government oversight, there's none of that stuff. We, I'm, I'm, I'm board certified. Uh, all of what I do is to the to the national registered standard of of medicine. Uh, I'm, I, I regularly follow these 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 updates. Uh, but what we really offer is that direct to patient uh, confidentiality, uh, access, uh, and support through the medical system, right? So so when you come see us, you're not going to go see, uh, you know, the nurse and the nurse practitioner and maybe every three or four visits the doctor. You're going to see me. But the other issue is you have something that goes on at 7 o'clock at night on a Saturday and you're like, you know, I got this thing Sunday. Can you help me, Right. Uh, if it's an urgent matter, yeah, absolutely, we're going to get that done. Uh, if you live in the Philadelphia area where I where I live and where my physical practice is right now, yeah, I, you know, you come into my office on a Sunday morning, we'll get you all stitched up or whatever it is to get you to the next thing. If, if you do that at your primary care doctor, one, it's not going to happen. Two, you'll probably have to go to an urgent care, uh, which urgent cares are fine. Many of them do very well, but you might wait for a while and you you may not know what kind of care you're going to get. You might get a physician. You probably get a PA or an MP. So we really specialize in quality medical medical care, uh, complete access, uh, anytime, everywhere. That's that's what we do. 
And the cherry on top to all of that is I'm an aerospace medicine specialist. Uh, I'm a pilot. So I know the ins and outs of what's going to cause you harm or difficulty of getting back up in the air or maintaining your medical, right? So I'm not going to give you certain medications if you're going to go on a trip in three days. Uh, maybe that helps you a little bit, but it's going to ground you. So those are those things that you really need to uh, look out for and most people aren't aware of. And that's what we that's what we pride ourselves in doing. Okay, so you said Philadelphia, and I'm looking here on your website. It says you also serve patients in Michigan, Maryland, West Virginia, Ohio, Illinois, Tennessee, and Georgia. So how are you doing that? Do you do a lot of telemedicine, or how does that work? Right, so that's a great question. So we have, uh, we have one physical office here in Philadelphia. We're expanding to Michigan uh, here in the next month uh, in the Lansing area. The, the way that it's set up is that every patient of, of uh, Volason needs to be seen in person for the first physical, right? So we do the physical evaluation. After that, we can do a lot of the, the medical uh, assessments and evaluations remotely, right? So I also know that there's also a lot of ATPs and people who fly regularly. So maybe they live in Maryland or maybe they live in, in Georgia or maybe they live in Philly and they, you know, they, they fly out of Detroit. I, you know, there are a lot of people who do not domicile where they're based, right? So that's the advantage uh, of, of this is you can have your primary care doctor. You can have them have me pretty much anywhere you are, right? So that's just where you have to live or be domiciled uh, where the physical exam starts. After that, if you happen to be anywhere in the United States, right, I have the ability to care for you uh, in the event that you get sick on the road uh, in a, a telehealth setting, right? So if it's a big issue, you need to go to the hospital, we'll tell you to go to the hospital. But a lot of things can be taken remote, taken care of remotely uh, with a lot of the end user devices. So that's a whole other thing to get into here in a minute. But uh, there's a company called Nonagon, uh, which is based in Israel. But they have pretty much this end user device that allows you to listen to your, uh, you know, for me to listen to your heart, uh, your your heart sounds, your lung sounds, gives me your heart rate, your pulse ox, uh, also gives you a respiration rate, uh, and and your temperature. So I have all these vitals at my hand when you're, you know, 2000 miles away. So that allows me to take care of you. And every patient who signs on with Volosan gets one of these. They don't have to pay for anything. It's not, it's all included. Uh, and that's a, a huge benefit because you just take this thing with you and wherever you are, you need to be seen. We take care of you. Cool. Where were you like my whole life, man? Well, <laughs> I guess I was over here. <laughs> You're on the East Coast. In Philly. All right. All right. Well, in Michigan. That's where I grew up. So. All right. All right. It's a bad question anyway. Well, okay. So I, I guess then that, that really begs, of course, the question here that we all just have to ask now is, that sounds fantastic. What does it cost? So currently, the I have one price, right? So my objective is I don't need to nickel and dime people. It's just one price. You pay one monthly fee, and that's it. That's for you. So my current price is $149 a month. That takes care of you uh, at home, away, wherever you are. Uh, that that includes uh, basic labs. That includes uh, all point of care testing, like your analysis, EKGs, all the things that don't really cost much, right? So the only thing that really costs me a lot right now, there's three things. One, our COVID PCR test. So the rapid tests are fine. The COVID PCRs, they, they cost a little bit right now. So it costs me about $65. Or sorry, it costs me uh, $69 or something like that. I, I don't have it up right now. But what it also is, you get an answer in 30 minutes, right? You go, you need to go fly somewhere, though they change the regs here. But if you go fl fly somewhere, you need to get a PCR test. It's going to go ahead. And take in a day or two, are you going to miss your flight? Are you going to make your flight? Do you need to have another test done? All that stuff. You get in, you get in 30 minutes in my office. Uh, the, other, the other two things are blood work and, and imaging. So I guess I have a question for you. Hey, when was the last time you had blood work done? Uh, February. February. Do you know, it, was it just kind of standard blood work or was it something a little more complex? 
Well, I, I went in, I was like, you know what? It's actually been a while since I had done blood work. So I, I sort of went in there and just said, you know, give me the, the full, full panel or whatever. I mean, I think they tested me for like 14 different things or whatever, everything from, you know, cholesterol through whatever. Mm-hmm. I even had them test like testosterone mm-hmm. levels and things like okay. that. But yeah, they tested me for a lot of stuff. And, and, and did you, did you get the, um, did they give you a bill for that? Did you have to pay anything out of pocket for that? The, uh, I'm sure I did. I mean, I know I co-paid when I went into my doctor. I'm, I don't remember what if there was a separate bill for labs. Okay, yeah. So usually there's a separate bill for labs. Uh, some people that's included, some people it's not for basic stuff, right? So for our stuff, the basic stuff is included. But our labs are probably about 10% of the cost that it is everywhere else. Most people you're going to cause, you know, it's going to cost you like, you know, 25 bucks for a, for a CBC, which is a easy blood count. For us, it's like $4. And, and and this is the differences within the direct primary care world, right? So so you don't have to pay these large exorbitant fees and then your insurance has to battle it and then you end up paying, you know, this lower fee, but you still have to pay copay on top of, you know, your, your premium. And, and, you know, when you go in to see the doc, you got to pay for that too. Like it's it's just all nonsense, right? So so that's the, the benefit of that. The other thing is imaging, right? So imaging is expensive. Uh, so for most people, Imaging sometimes is covered, but it usually is covered at like 80%. So you still have to pay 20. But what ends up happening is the insurance companies, they mark it up somewhere in the neighborhood of like 400%. So you're actually paying a lot more than that. So for us, everything's transparent and you know exactly what the score is, right? So right now, my x rays are 75 bucks. You can get an ultrasound anywhere in your body, 140 bucks. MRIs, four and a quarter. And CTs are two thirty, right? And the question is like, when can I get these done? I just had a patient today. Um, he came in uh, approximately a week ago. Had a, a for confidentiality reasons, right? So a big thing is confidentiality. I can't tell you uh, what he does or or what really happened, but it was an upper limb injury. Uh, and uh, I saw him. Uh, we did some X rays here in the office. I have a I have a, a on site ultrasound which I use to see what's going on. Everything looked okay. Uh, so we went ahead and. Uh, just saw, saw he did over the next week and he ended up uh, not doing as well as we'd liked. So we went ahead and we got him an MRI. Now, right now, MRIs are totally backlogged because of COVID and other things. And there's just not enough staff. Uh, and most people are booking out well into July. I called yesterday. He had his MRI done today. And that's it. Yes. Yeah, you know, so for those of us that are involved in the uh, institutionalized healthcare type systems, especially out here out west and the you know populous areas where it's just a gigantic uh, healthcare system. Yeah, those those battles. It's like why why for me to go get imaging or something? It it just feels like an uphill battle the whole time. And then at the end, I'm rewarded with well, I don't know how much it's going to cost. And then in eight months, I get hit with a bill for twelve hundred bucks right. or, or something like that. You know, right. it, it's yeah okay. So to to be able to circumvent that alone is probably enough to bring down your blood pressure, but, um, yeah, it's just, I've never understood it. Right. So I, I come from this idea where regardless of what you think, right. People are people. They should be treated as people. We're not a commodity for the insurance companies or the hospitals. And I feel bad for doctors, right? So doctors, they come up with all this debt they want to do something good. They need to pay off their debt. So they go to a hospital where they're going to take care of people and they're taken advantage of by the insurance companies and the hospitals, right? Because who pays their bill? Who, who pays them? The hospitals or the insurance companies? The patient doesn't pay them, right? So, so it becomes very convoluted and that's a very easy exercise to be able to milk the most out of the system uh, because the government plays a large part in writing policy. So it becomes very convoluted, and, and, and I feel for every patient that has to go through the system uh, is if they're not well-versed. I mean, I feel like I'm pretty well-versed, and I get all these junk billings every day, and it sucks. So, so I, th- that's what this is for. This is to take care of people at a very reasonable price uh, without any hassle and knowing that they're getting just as good, if not better care than they would anywhere else, and I truly believe that. The other add add on which I forgot about this. So anybody who has my who who signs up as a member, uh, their spouse uh, can get the same membership for seventy five dollars a month or seventy four dollars a month, and all the kids anybody under the age of eighteen but older than two, 
uh, they'll get episodic care for free. So if they bump their knee, they sprain their wrist, whatever that, they get that care for free. They don't have to do any of that stuff. They don't have to pay for any of that stuff. Um, so, so that's kind of the all-encompassing stuff uh, that, that I want to project out there, that that's good quality care. And more importantly, uh, when you're up in the air or when you're flying or you're on the road, the last thing you want to worry about is your four-year-old or your seven-year-old who got a cut on their leg or their arm or whatever it is, and now you got to worry about that. And having a doc like me on the other end that says, hey, yeah, just go see you know, Doc Fine. He'll go take care of them. Everything will be fine. You don't have to pay for anything. It'll be done in an hour, right? Well, that's a huge sense of relief on the road. They don't have to worry about that. I'm sold. So assuming I wanted to sign up or I've listened to this and I, I want to go check you out, where can I find you? So you can uh, find me at volosan.com. You can read a little bit more about my practice and how it functions. Uh, you can email me, uh, Eric Fine at uh, Eric dot Fine, sorry at volason uh, You can call our office two six seven six two two four four one six, or I'm sure you can you know uh, get me through you if you have any questions, and I'm happy to discuss. Right, so I can't give true medical advice over the phone uh, regarding this unless we're in established patient care, but I can always find a way to kind of help you along the way and what we can do to make this uh get you to the right spot uh, i think that's that's the best thing there yeah well hey thank you so much for coming back on the show thank you very much thanks for having me hopefully i can uh, do some more of this uh, with you guys in the future and uh, hopefully this is uh, educational and uh, people will get something out of this today so what do you all think of that concept I mean, I think it's pretty cool, well, obviously, because I brought Dr. Fine on the show. But to have somebody like him, just a phone call or a teledoc visit away, no matter where you are in the world, and not just as a consult, but to you know, be able to have your vitals off of a device that you're wearing, that's not something you should be taken for granted, I don't think. And especially if you're flying and you need to be treated for something or your family needs to be treated for something while you're gone, to have somebody in aviation with that knowledge that can help you, that actually understands that, I think it's just that this is money. So let's be honest, I've called Dr. Fine a couple of times over the last few years, and uh, I've been really glad that he was able to give me, you know, the advice that I needed. And I didn't even have a nonagon. But in all seriousness, let me know what you think about this idea, and if maybe if you signed up and tried it or something like it, because I don't think there is anything like it out there. Because even though I don't have anything in it, like I'm not an owner or anything, I'm honestly just curious, and I think everyone wants to know, especially including Dr. Fine. So let me know what you think, and you can obviously contact me through social media or brand at podcastingonaplane.com. And if you need any help getting to Dr. Fine, obviously go to his website, but I can help you out as well. And unlike the healthcare system, Podcasting on a Plane is 100% listener supported, and I'd like to keep it that way. So if you have the means and you find value in it, I'd really appreciate having you on board as a patron. You get episodes early and sometimes fun stuff too. So if you want to be a supporter, head over to podcastingonaplane.com and click on support the show. And that's what new mega super Captain ATP supporter Seth Lake did. Yes, that's Seth Lake, the contact creator. And uh, Seth, thank you so much for your generosity. And I'm really glad to have you on board, man. If you're not into the recurring thing, I understand there's a PayPal link right there too for whatever you feels right. Or you can go to buymeacoffee.com forward slash Bravo Golf spelled out and do it in increments of three bucks. It's probably the only way you can get a coffee for three bucks now anyway. You can also use your smartphone or use a speak pipe widget that pops up when you visit podcasting on a plane to record something. It might even end up on the show like the clip at the beginning of this one, which was sent in by listener Dustin Balin. Thanks. As always, I thank you so much for your support and feedback in whatever form it takes and for listening to the show and passing the word along to... Oh, wait, wait a minute, hang on. I almost forgot. We are closing in on episode number 100. I know, can you believe it? It only took me like five years. Anyway, I want to do something really special and I have a couple of things planned already and one surprise guest that you're never going to guess, but who I know you're going to love. And what I want to do is make sure that all of you who follow this show and who have followed it since the beginning or whenever you came in, get a chance to participate. So if you haven't done so before, please record me something or anything you'd like to say about the show or something, maybe a takeaway from a guest, like a story that affected you or what somebody said that helped you out or whatever. But I want to put you on the show as a thank you for listening. You don't have to, you know, blow sunshine, you know what I'm saying? But anything that you want to say, I'd love to have it on here and stitch it all together as a, just a mega listener feedback episode. I think it'd be a ton of fun. So if you want to be on episode 100, please do send me something. I really encourage you to. It's going to be awesome. 
and uh, I can't wait to put it all together. Anyway, that's all for now. Your frequency change is approved until next time, and report back on this frequency for the next episode. And then, the big one. Good day. The Podcasting on a Plane podcast is presented for entertainment purposes only. Brandon's comments and those of his guests, the website's content and any of the social media, etc. are not part of his official responsibility as a controller or as an FAA employee. The views and opinions you hear on the podcast are his and those of his guests, and not necessarily that of the FAA. Also, while he's a CFI, he's not acting as your CFI, nor is he your mechanic, your doctor, your shrink or your spouse. This podcast is presented for entertainment, camaraderie and fun, but is in no way, shape or form professional advice or legal counsel. If you're in need of professional advice, get some from somewhere more appropriate than a podcast, no matter how good this one may be.